Oh, John. John, do you know what day this is? Yeah, it's Tuesday. I mean, do you know the date? Sure, it's the 28th, isn't it? And I suppose you know the month. Certainly, it's May. What is this, a kindergarten quiz? Well, doesn't that combination mean anything to you? Uh, let's see. Tuesday, May 28th. No, I can't say... Oh, hold on a minute. My insurance policy is due. Did you take care of it, Betty? Yes, I did. Don't I always take care of it? Come on, now, can't you think of anything else connected with this day? Gosh, Betty, it's pretty early in the morning for any concentrated thinking. You know I'm no good until I've been up a couple of hours. Oh, you're no good, period, John Kendall. Do you mean to stand there like a ninny and admit to me that you've forgotten again? Jeepers, huh? you've got me worried. Oh. Hey, wait. By George, I've got it. The poll tax has to be paid before uh -huh. June 1st. Betty, put down that lamp. Uh, what are you going to do? I... <laughs> oh, my head. Oh, now I remember. This is our wedding anniversary. Poor John. But if you're a married man, you know he just committed an unforgivable faux pas. That bump on his head is a visible expression of his wife's displeasure, what you might call visible speech. Well, isn't that a coincidence? That's the title of our program for the day. And here at my side, prepared to make his speech audible, if not visible, is our science reporter, Al Zink, ready to bring us another excursion in science. Thank you, Bob Stone, and how do you do, everyone? I'm indebted to Dr. Ralph K. Potter, Director of Transmission Research, Bell Telephone Laboratories, for the scientific background of the subject we are about to discuss. What on earth is this visible speech, Al? Is the tongue likely to become an obsolete organ? I don't think you need to worry about that, Bob. We're not likely to become a race of strong, silent men. But visible speech is just what its name implies, a method of making speech visible. It's a means for taking the sounds of the voice and translating them into patterns on a screen. And when you know what the various patterns mean, you can read them and thus know the words that made them without using your ears at all. It's a new written language. That should tend to reduce the size of the human ear, I hope. Is this new method based upon handwriting? No, it's not, Bob. It's a form of voice writing. I'm pretty much at sea on this thing. Did I understand you to say these patterns appear on a screen? That's right. When you speak into a microphone, luminous patterns representing the sounds of your voice march across a screen not unlike those used in television receivers. Anyone who is familiar with these patterns can read their meaning, even though he may not be able to hear the sounds that made them. Quite astounding. I hope my tonal qualities will lend themselves to a graceful design. That's another important point, Bob. Visible speech is completely phonetic. Every sound has a shape of its own, and words are spelled out in patterns just as you speak them. If you know the basic sounds, you can produce words you see, even though you may not know their meaning. The pattern shapes depend entirely upon what is happening in the speaker's mouth, how it is changing shape, where the tongue is held, and so forth. Actually, the patterns constitute a sort of map of mouth movement. Sort of a dental radar, eh? Don't tell me this marvelous device can speak all kinds of languages. Strange as it seems, that's a fact, Bob. The cathode ray translator, and that's what we call a device producing the patterns, may be used not only for English, but for French, Russian, Spanish, Italian, or any other language. Now I've heard everything. Would you uh, tell us something about the patterns this versatile translator makes, Al? Certainly. As I said earlier, every sound has its own shape. Sounds simple to the ear make simple patterns, while sounds that are complex have a complicated appearance. A simple sound, such as a click made by snapping two coins together, produces a vertical line on the screen. This visible click, resembling a fence post, would appear at the right edge of the screen, move across to the left, and disappear. A series of clicks would make a series of vertical lines, a sort of parade of fence posts. I think my little daughter might enjoy that display. What are some of the other patterns? Another simple sound is a tone. A single tone makes a single straight horizontal line, something like a rail on a fence. As long as the tone lasts, this line continues. If it is a low-pitched tone, the line will appear near the bottom of the screen. If it's high-pitched, it will appear toward the top. 
It's got us pretty well fenced in, Al. What kind of a pattern would it make if I said, shh? The hissing sounds have distinctive patterns that look a bit like hanging moss, Bob. All these patterns have a meaning just as the queer tracks and scratches we make on paper and call writing have a meaning. So if you know what sounds they stand for, you can read the meaning even though you don't hear the voice that made them. Now wouldn't this new technique enable a deaf person to hear speech by seeing it? That is one of the practical applications, Bob. It seems reasonable to expect it in the future. When practical translators are developed, it should be possible for a totally deaf person to read the patterns of speech transmitted over a telephone or to understand what is being said on the radio. That's really quite revolutionary, Al. It surely is, Bob. But there is another possible use of visible speech that is of even greater importance to the deaf. As you may know, one who has been born deaf or has been deaf for a long time talks in a very unnatural voice. It is simply that they have never heard or have forgotten natural speech, and teaching them to speak is much like trying to teach someone to draw with a blindfold over his eyes. Their unnatural speech tends to discourage social contacts. The translator should be able to help this situation by enabling the deaf person to compare his speech with normal expression and practice correct pronunciation. Sounds very promising, Al. Just how much work has been done along these lines by Dr. Potter and his associates at the Bell Laboratories? Have actual classes been conducted? Yes. Early in the development, a class was organized to discover just how long it would take to learn the patterns. A group of four young ladies was selected, all of whom had normal hearing. They had no particular difficulty, and in about eight months, they were quite proficient in reading the patterns. Learning the language of visible speech seems to be about as difficult as learning a foreign language. And as in learning any language, you improve with practice. But you mentioned, Al, that all the young ladies had normal hearing. Have the patterns actually been taught to deaf people? Yes, they have. Some time after the class was formed, a man who had been deaf from birth joined the group. He learned to read the pattern just as easily as the girls. When he first came, it was explained to him that he was being asked to participate in a development that might enable the deaf to understand the speech of others. He was frankly skeptical and said that he had no faith in aids for the deaf. He had tried too many of them. Recently, this same man wrote in a letter to the Cavalier a paper for the deaf, these words. It sounded to me impossible at the beginning, but I am convinced now. There is no doubt in my mind that the cathode ray translator will have far-reaching influence on the education of the deaf and that it will give manifold joys to them after they leave school. Well, that's certainly an enthusiastic opinion. How did research along this line come to be started, Al? Dr. Potter told me that naturally the Bell Laboratories are primarily concerned with the effects of transmission upon speech. Before the war, they started some special studies of speech distortion for which available measurement methods were inadequate. It appeared that the most satisfactory method of analysis might be some sort of speech picture, and visible speech was the result. Have you any idea when this service will become available to the general public? That is still rather problematical, Bob. I want to emphasize that so far, visible speech is entirely an experimental development. We don't want to hold out hope to those who are deaf that sometime next week, next month, or even next year, this method will be available to them, because that certainly is not the case. I'd like to emphasize, too, that at present, visible speech is a principle, not a machine. The principle is very promising in many fields, teaching foreign languages and music, investigating the sounds of machinery and even the calls of birds, to mention a few, but they are still only promises. We are encouraged and have high hopes, but let's make it plain that visible speech for general use is not just around the corner. Well, we can still hope the corner is not too many blocks away. Thank you, Al, and we're much obliged to Dr. Potter for his contributions to our program. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to have a copy of a paper by Dr. Ralph K. Potter, Director of Transmission Research, Bell Telephone Laboratories, a paper which will repeat the facts you have just heard with additional interesting information, all you have to do is address a penny postcard to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are now listening, asking for scientific paper number 243, entitled Visible Speech, 
That's scientific paper number 243, visible speech. Your copy will be put in the mail for you free of charge. Now I have a feeling that friends of our excursions are waiting for that display of profound knowledge which we like to call question and answer time. Might I request, Al, that you dispense with visible speech for the nonce and give the following matters your articulate expression. This portion of our program is devoted to the answering of scientific questions which your listeners have sent in. The answers reflect the most up-to-date and accurate information available since they are based on facts provided by staff members of the General Electric Research Laboratory or other equally trustworthy institutions. Now, that's clearly understood. Here's our first question. A gentleman in Amsterdam, New York, inquires, is it possible to cut down a tree with electricity and is the wire used some special kind? Yes, Bob, it is possible. and was actually done by Henry Boosman of General Electric. The wire was made of nichrome and was heated with electricity. The heated wire was then used to burn through the tree in a manner similar to the fire method used by the Indians. So even trees are sometimes condemned to the hot seat, Al. Well, we have a question now relating to the dairy industry. Our listener would like to know, is a chemical used in homogenizing milk, and if not, how is it done? There is no chemical used in homogenizing milk. It is done by forcing the fluid through small openings so that the various globules of fat are broken up into much smaller ones, which will not separate as cream so readily. Thank you, Al. Now a lady steps into the spotlight to ask, what would cause aluminum cooking utensils made of thick pressed sheets or castings to pit, while other utensils made of aluminum sheets pressed thin do not show any pitting? Well, Bob, the materials referred to are undoubtedly not of pure aluminum, but are commercial alloys, which may be one of several compositions, and possess, consequently, different properties. The pitting in the thicker cast sections may be due not necessarily to actual pitting taking place, but the showing up or uncovering of porosity in the cast metal, a general characteristic of aluminum casting. Well, that seems to dispose of the culinary department. We come next to a very unusual question which intrigued me no end. Is it true that if pigs are killed when the moon is at a certain stage, there will not be so much grease in the meat when it is fried? And also, if potatoes are planted when the moon is at a certain stage, will they all go to stock? I'll have to answer all that in the negative, Bob. Although it is a widespread superstition that the phases of the moon affect the growth of certain plants and animals, this is not believed to be true by scientists. Since we've had a question about the moon, I feel we shouldn't neglect the sun. This listener wishes to learn... In what direction is the Earth traveling around the Sun? Also, what part of the Earth's surface is the front with reference to the Earth's motion around the Sun? Let's explain it this way, Bob. If at noon on the 21st of March, the day of the beginning of spring, you point directly west, you are pointing in the direction the Earth is traveling around the Sun. At this date, it is towards the constellation of Sagittarius, the Archer, which is prominent in the summer evening sky. At the same time of year at midnight, you would point to the east to indicate the direction we are traveling. About sunrise, we are on the front part of the Earth in its orbit of motion around the sun. You've got me going round and round, Al. Uh, let's get on a more stabilized subject. Uh, let's have this next letter. The writer says, Heat is sometimes referred to as a form of radiant energy, implying that heat as such has a definite wavelength and frequency and has a definite separate form of wave vibration. Yet in school we were taught that heat was more or less subjective, that it resulted when one or other of the forms of radiant energy was stopped by something material, some form of matter. Will you explain this? Heat is a form of radiant energy that consists of waves similar to light waves, but of longer wavelength than the longest red rays, which are called infrared. Thus they do have a definite wavelength, and they travel in the same way as light or other forms of radiant energy. They travel across space from the sun to the earth. When they strike an opaque body, they are absorbed, and their energy raises the body's temperature, which is referred to also as heat. Therefore, the word heat really has two different meanings. Now, here's a job in mechanics for you, Al. Can you advise this listener on what he can do to prevent the earth from swelling under his garage during the winter so the doors cannot be opened? There are two suggestions which might work. One is to place a foundation under the ends of the garage and door opening so that the garage is enabled to rise with the expansion of the earth underneath. In this way, the door opening will remain in the same place, and the door can be opened and closed freely in all kinds of weather. 
This foundation should extend across the entire front of the garage and should be six or eight inches thick and about 18 inches or two feet deep. In addition, it should be made in one piece and of good grade concrete. The other suggestion is to install vertical sliding doors in place of the hinged or track doors, which our friend probably has now. The cost of these doors should be about the same as that of the foundation. Al, well, there's only one meaning for that look I see in the control operator's <laughs> eye. So lest it cost us his continuing goodwill, we'd better get off the air. So thank you, Al Zing, and goodbye, everyone, until our next excursion in science.